Good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to our session on Project Scara, which is about migrating OpenDK to Git and GitHub. I'm Eric. And I'm Robin. And today we want to share with you all how we utilize Git and GitHub for a very large open source project. This is what we're going to dive into today and share the details with all of you. So before we begin, let's look at who we are talking to you today. We are coming to you live from Stockholm, Sweden, and I'm Eric. I worked in open source for more than eight years now, uh, primarily on the OpenEDK project. My usual day job when I'm not migrating projects over to Git, then I'm hacking on the Java virtual machine. And if you swing by my desk, you'll often see me living in a terminal in a shell somewhere. All right, and I'm Robin. And I've also worked with and contributed to open source in various capacities since at least 2005. And my background is mostly in operating systems and platform specific development. Uh, and I've been working on runtime aspects of the Java virtual machine for a few years now. And unlike Eric, I willingly admit that I prefer a good IDE to perform my daily development activities in. However, enough about us, let's get started. So uh, let's start with a brief discussion of what the OpenJDK project actually is. So simply put, it's the project that develops the reference implementation of the Java platform. And the Java platform includes the Java class library the Java compiler, and the Java virtual machine, which is called Hotspot. And while Java itself celebrated its 25th birthday just last year, uh, it was actually made open source by Sun Microsystems back in 2007. So I guess that's a little bit over 13, or maybe it's 14 years now ago. Uh, so this is when the OpenJDK project was created. And from the OpenJDK source code, Oracle, uh, as well as many other vendors like Red Hat, SAP, Amazon, Azul, just to mention a few, go on to create distributions of Java in various forms. And to qualify a bit what we mean when we say a large open source project, so the OpenJDK contains over seven and a half million lines of code and they form over a hundred thousand distinct commits. And over the years the project has seen over a thousand unique contributors and of those there are over 300 that have remained active over longer periods of time and have attained the roles of reviewers and committers in the project. And we'll talk a little bit more about those roles later. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that we're not exaggerating when we say that the OpenJDK can be considered a fairly large open source project. And today we want to share with you how we transitioned the OpenJDK project from self-hosted Mercurial servers, first to Git and then also to GitHub. And this journey has been going on for more than three years. And uh, just last fall, uh, we reached the nearly final milestone of having the main JDK project transition over. And today we're gonna to share all the details with you. So the first step is to go from Mercurial to Git. So both Mercurial and Git are version control systems. They were actually created around the same time. And OpenJDK has been utilizing Mercurial since the start. Now, whenever you want to go from a known version control system, perhaps you're going from Subversion or Perforce or CVS even, and you want to transition to Git, then there is one man page, a manual page, that you're going to be staring at a lot, and that's the manual page for Git fast import. So the Git developers really thought about having people be able to take existing version control data from another version control system and move it into Git and create the Git fast import tool. So you can think of Git fast import as kind of a Swiss army knife for getting data into Git. Regardless of the shape your data is in, 
You can usually use fast import to get it into Git. So me and Robin wrote a custom exporter in Java and all you have to do then is adhere to the git fast import protocol which actually is fairly simple. Our custom exporter exporting all the data from a Mercury repository weighs in just around a couple of thousand lines of code. And this is great because if you write your own custom exporter you can also take the opportunity to slightly change the repository metadata. For example for OpenADK we changed the commit message format to align a bit more with how the Git community formats commit messages. And with this, we were able to convert over 100,000 commits from Mercurial into Git. So, uh, now that the actual conversion of Mercurial to Git has been taken care of, uh, it's time to talk a little bit about the transition from a self-hosted Mercurial repository to using an external one hosted by GitHub. Uh, and to get a little context on why this matters, uh, I want to start with describing the OpenJDK, the existing OpenJDK development practices a bit. So after all, these practices have had over 13 years to stabilize and can be considered quite mature by now. So first, all discussions and reviews of what actually goes into the OpenJDK is handled using various mailing lists. And a quick look at the index reveals that there are over 150 active ones, uh, which can certainly feel a bit intimidating, at least if you're a new contributor. And secondly, the OpenJDK project defines multiple contributor roles. So after you have submitted your very first small patches to OpenJDK, uh, you're able to attain the author role, which uh, makes it a little bit easier to contribute further. And after you have contributed a number of reasonably sized changes, you can then go ahead and obtain the committer role. And finally, the reviewer role with a capital R uh, requires a good amount of both changes and actually participating in reviewing code. However, as soon as you obtain the committer role, you also obtain direct push access to the repository. Uh, but this, however, doesn't mean that you can just push whatever you want to. Uh, every push must be done with a correctly formatted commit message. It needs to reference an issue in the issue tracker and at least one of these capital R reviewers must have approved it. Uh, and as I said, all these reviews must be done over email before anything can be pushed. So this is a little bit different from the usual GitHub workflow where you open up a pull request and eventually get them accepted by a maintainer, uh, perhaps after a bit of discussion using comments in that pull request. So one of the main questions for us was how can we make both seasoned OpenJDK contributors uh, and as well as newcomers feel comfortable with working on OpenJDK and using pull requests. Uh, and in order to support existing OpenJDK development practices uh, wherever possible, there are four key areas where we have made customizations to the more standard GitHub workflow. Uh, and those are checks, notifications, commands and dependent pull requests. Uh, I want to start a little bit uh, and talk about how we use GitHub checks to enforce our OpenJDK specific requirements. Uh, and one goal here was also to automate as much as possible, uh, because there's certainly no need to waste valuable reviewer time on manually checking that lines don't end with trailing white spaces, for example. So instead we want our reviewers to focus on the important aspects like design and correctness of the implementation. Uh, and these checks that we speak of are performed as soon as a pull request is opened up. 
because when a pull request is created, uh, you are usually at a stage where you are looking for human reviewer feedback and you are ready to make changes based on that feedback. So it makes a lot of sense to also provide this automated feedback at the very same time. And some examples of these checks that we have implemented are our role-based access controls uh, that handles the OpenJDK notion of roles like reviewers and committers and can give them different capabilities. And we do a bit of bug tracker integration. We, for example, ensure that every pull request references an open issue and that the issue itself hasn't already been used to in a, a different commit already. And uh, we also uh, do some more uh, checks of the actual content of the commit as well to ensure that there is no uh, extra white space, that the file permissions are correct. And for example, we don't allow binary files or symbolic links in our repository. Another thing we do is to provide relevant notifications to both reviewers and contributors. Now what's important here is to, as Robin already mentioned, not waste reviewer time. As is common in many open source projects, OpenDK features much fewer reviewers than we have contributors. So it's important that these experienced members of the community can get notifications on time and also for errors that they care about. Remember that OpenDK contains more than 7.5 million lines of code and of course no one can review all of those lines. So reviewers typically work in a designated area of the code and we must provide notifications to just that area. If you think about the more common GitHub workflow, then you might get notifications for every pull request, for example. So uh, we have implemented GitHub apps that whenever a contributor so much submits a new pull request, goes through the change files and then maps the change files to labels. So for example, if you want to change how OpenDK is built, you're probably going to change a make file. And when you change a make file, we will apply the label build. Accordingly, as can be seen on the image on the side here, on the slide, we will also send a notification email to the traditional OpenDK mail lists that corresponds to the label. So for example, for the build label, we send an email to the build development mail list where the reviewers all hang out and can then have a look at the change. Again, reviewer time is valuable, so Notifications are not sent out directly because often when a contributor submits a pull request, there might be one issue that, you know, you maybe added a tra trading white space, or maybe you forgot to do some other kinds of formatting, maybe you forgot to reference an issue in the database, etc. Uh, all of these checks must be passed before the reviewer gets the notification to ensure the re reviewer does not spend time on reviewing things and policies that a computer can enforce. So here is also important to note that reviewers will get notified in the way they prefer. Some reviewers in OpenDK prefer the more classical open source approach of having a large number of mailing lists where they can subscribe to each mail list and utilize their favorite email readers. Other reviewers might prefer, for example, to get uh, GitHub notifications either on GitHub mobile, desktop or via a web browser. Now they can choose and use the workflow that suits them the best. Another thing we implemented to help both reviewers and contributors are commands. So commands comes both in the forms of pull request commands and commit commands. And here we're going to start out by having a look at the pull request commands. So a command that sounds really fancy, but in practice it's just a comment on a PR that starts with a slash. Many of you might recognize this from other applications such as IRC or Slack where if you start with a slash in a, when you type something, it often means a command. The OpenDK GitHub apps will then look in comments or pull requests and take action depending on the type of command you typed. This can be utilized to automi automate many of the workflows found within OpenDK. For example, we allow OpenDK committers to merge their own pull requests even though they don't have direct write access to the upstream repository. Commit messages that should be the final commit message of the integrated commit 
corresponding to the pull request can be formatted without the tedious work of having git do merging, rebasing, and force pushing. Instead, you can just use commands, and the OpenDK GitHub apps will transform the final commit message. In addition, uh, they are also uh, automatically uh, checked uh, requirements that can be added by a reviewer. For example, a reviewer can say that this kind of change will require a compatibility and specification review, which is an even more in-depth review than just a regular co code review. Java and OpenDK takes backwards compatibility very seriously, uh, so changes that are changing public APIs must undergo an additional step of reviewing. Here you see some examples of various pull request commands. Uh, most users and contributors will type the slash integrate command. This rebases and quashes all the commits in the pull request into a single commit that is applied on top of the target branch. It also formats the final commit message. These are a number of steps that we can automate on behalf of the users in order to not waste their time. As I mentioned about the compatibility and specification review, a reviewer can issue the slash CSR command to require such a review before the pull request can be integrated. Uh, for newcomers, we also want to make it easy for an experienced reviewer to say that they will sponsor the pull request and take care of any follow-up issues. Therefore, we provide a slash sponsor command to make new contributions as easy as possible to get into the repository. Finally, we also feature commit commands. These are very similar to their pull request equivalents, but they are made on commits that are already integrated into the repository, not on pull requests. For example, you can use a slash tag command to create a tag on a particular commit without having direct byte access to the upstream repository. We also feature commit commands that allow commits to be cherry-picked between branches and repositories. This is useful if you are, for example, like for OpenDK, are maintaining multiple releases at the same time, and you find yourself often in the need of cherry-picking commits made to the most recent release to older, more stable releases. The final and fourth feature that we have implemented is called Dependent Pull Request. And this is more aimed at contributors than at reviewers. So on GitHub, a pull request must always target a branch in the upstream repository. You cannot use another pull request as the target for your work. Why is this a problem? Well, sometimes if you make a contribution, reviewing can take a bit of time. Let's say you make a complicated change to the JVM, or you are changing a public API in the core libraries. Then a review can often take a couple of days or even weeks if it's a really tough uh, matter to solve. So what if you have work building on this contribution that you also want to contribute, but well, that's a problem with GitHub today. You can't really target your existing pull request as the target for your second pull request, even though they build upon each other. So we implemented a way to work around this and solve this, and we call them dependent pull requests. For every pull request that is created, our tooling will automatically create a branch in the upstream repository with the prefix pr slash. For example, if you just created pull request number 1049, then we will create a branch named pr slash 1049, referring to that pull request's head. Contributors can then use this pull request as targets for additional pull requests, which allows pull requests to be chained. This allows concurrent work to be ongoing uh, while reviews are still taking place. Note that uh, you cannot use the slash integrate command that we showed earlier on a pull request that depends on another pull request that isn't yet integrated. This ensures that the pull, request is in, the pull requests are integrated in order into the target repository. All uh, right, so finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the project itself. So Project SCARA is the OpenJDK project created to at first investigate uh, and then to actually perform the transition of OpenJDK to use Git and GitHub. And the project is open source and is written in Java. And it provides all these mentioned services and tools. And it makes uh, 
heavy use of the GitHub REST and also the GraphQL APIs. And it also provi provides the very same functionality for GitLab, the community edition. Uh, and we can also mention that uh, in addition to uh, the services and tools we have mentioned today, we also provide a suite of command line tools for OpenJDK developers that prefer to work in the terminal. So for people like Eric, there is actually no need to open up a web browser or any other graphical tool at any stage of the process of getting a change integrated into the OpenJDK. Given that Scara is an OpenJDK project meant to serve the OpenJDK community, we could also take the chance to actually use many of the innovations that are implemented and driven by the OpenJDK community. So, we try to feature and make use of as many recent Java innovations as we can in the Project Scara codebase. Why not? If anything doesn't work, then we will be the first to find out and we will have a chance to fix it. So, Project Scara uses many recent Java innovations such as modules, collections factory methods, local variable type invariants, the new HTTP client, and also text blocks. In addition to recent Java innovations, we also try to utilize all the cool new features coming to the Java virtual machine, or JVM for short, or the CLI tools that we deploy to users on their own workstations. We use AppCDS to decrease startup time significantly. Server side, we are heavily utilizing unified logging to understand what's going on. And we also use all the great enhancements to the G1 garbage collector to get lower latencies and better throughput. And that is pretty much what we wanted to talk about today. And if you want to learn more about the OpenJDK project, uh, feel free to visit openjdk.java.net. And you're, of course, very welcome to follow us at twitter.com slash openjdk. And finally, of course, you can find all the source code of OpenJDK and its many projects, such as Project Scara, uh, on github.com slash openjdk. Uh, right, so I think we have a question here. So uh, if we were to do the transition again, uh, what would you do different? And yeah, maybe I can answer that one. So at least one thing that I thought about is that we could probably go ahead and do this transition a lot faster than we actually did. Uh, there were a lot of concerns in the beginning that uh, it would be too difficult to adapt to this new way of working and we would break Java innovations for years to come. Uh, but when things actually uh, started to roll out, we found that users could become productive in, or even more productive than before in just a few days. So it really turned out to be nothing to worry about. So it seems like we got another question, and this time the question is, how did the community handle the transition? Uh, I guess I can uh, take this one. Uh, I think the community really, really stepped up this time around. We did provide mirrors and sandboxes for contributors and reviewers to try everything out beforehand. But I must admit that <laughs> both me and Robin were pretty nervous the weekend we switched everything over from Mercurial to Git for the main JDK project. Uh, thankfully, everyone from contributors to committers, reviewers, project leads had really prepared. So we did see a little bit of a lesser activity in the first week as people uh, got adjusted to the new tools and the new systems. But after the first week, uh, we've been up to the same uh, activity. And when I say activity, I mean commits and pull requests created and changes going in as before. Uh, and nowadays we see much more activity than we used to see on our old systems. So yeah, it's been stellar work by the community. They adapted much faster than, than either me or Robin could imagine. Uh, 
Uh, right, another question is uh, can the SCARA tooling be used for other open source projects? And I would guess the answer here would be sure, that would work fine. I mean, the SCARA, the SCARA tooling, all of it is open source and uh, it can be hosted by anyone for any project of choice. Uh, it's probably worth mentioning that there are might be a few like open jdk specifics here and there but if anyone would be interested in using this for like a different project uh, we would certainly be interested in helping out and taking a look at that and we have another question so what feature would we like to see as in me and Robin uh, for GitHub to implement? Uh, that's a good question. Um, personally, I would like to see them tackle something like we've done with the pen and pull requests. That feels like something that probably should be part of the platform, I guess. Uh, but this is tough. I mean, they probably have all their own priorities. Uh, speaking as someone developing uh, GitHub apps and utilizing their platform, I would really like to see access tokens being scoped to uh, repositories so you don't have to have a, an account-wide access token that can be a security issue uh, but that is more for people actually <laughs> uh, like me and Robin developing GitHub apps uh, but depending on pull requests, yeah that would be cool to see uh, on the main GitHub platform itself and then we have a final question what Java innovation are you looking forward to the most? Uh, I don't know about you, Robin, but personally, I really look forward to Project Loom uh, and the way it will ease concurrency for Java developers uh, and make threading so much easier to use in the future. So, we have another question. Uh, what has the experience been like using Java modules? That's a great question. And remember that SCARA was actually started a couple of years ago. Actually, let me go back to the slide uh, where we discuss the Java innovations that we use for Project Scara. So uh, we do use quite a few of them as you can see and one of the first ones we really wanted to kick the tires off and make use of was Java modules. Since Scara was initiated uh, around two and a half to three years ago, so modules were still quite fresh uh, coming JDK 9 uh, when we started working on Scara. And it's actually been a blast. There were a lot of <laughs> discussions in the Java community, whether things would just break all over the place, if there will be troubles everywhere, but uh, for us it's been a really great choice. Uh, we use them for strong encapsulation. So for example, in a project like Scara, where we need to migrate from Mercurial to Git, we have implementations in the source code for both interacting with a Mercurial repository and a Git repository, and those are in separate packages. But we don't want any other code uh, that are interacting with repositories to know whether it's interacting with a Mercurial or a Git repository in order to avoid building in assumptions about the repository. Therefore, we have a version control module called VCS that encapsulates the Git and Mercurial packages so that code utilizing the VCS module can only interact with a more abstract interface called repository. This turned out to be a great design choice and has enabled us to avoid assumptions in the code about Git or Mercurial specifics. Another way we utilize modules are for the CLI tools. So this needs to start really fast. No one wants to type, for example, git sync and then wait for a very long time before something happens. Usually developers want uh, something around 250 at most milliseconds before the command completes or becomes interactive when you work on the CLI. Personally, I want it more around 80 to 100 milliseconds. And for that, since we're using modules, we can use JLink to create J images uh, that start up much faster than the equivalent uh, uh, jar would have been executed. So that was also another great benefit for us from using modules. Robin, I don't know, you've been working a lot on, on loading the bots at runtime. Uh, can you talk more about that? Um, yeah, sure. So uh, all our different services are split into, uh, depending on their functionality, 
and same way here we have uh, a simple API that is exposed and then we hide or encapsulate the actual functionality and it was very useful to use the server disco service discovery or service providing features of modules so for example when the server side application starts up it does a quick discovery on just what uh, services or bots do we have in this particular image and the module system provides this for us and then we can just let them configure themselves and for example this also this might be more useful during development but it's very easy to just add like another module you don't need to rebuild the image or package you can just drop it next to it and uh, the service discovery will pick it up uh, and that has been very convenient for us i guess we should also mention that when we started out uh, support in like build systems and testing frameworks was a bit so so uh, but since then uh, both Maven and Gradle and also testing frameworks like JUnit have acquired really good module support. So I think we would have had an even easier journey if we started out with modules today. One other question is that, uh, so in Scara you have actually been using quite a few of these newer Java features. So do you have uh, like any favorite new feature that you want to talk a bit more about and yeah maybe i can start so something we touched upon earlier for example is the the http client uh, i've been using it uh, quite a bit on the parts i've written in scara and it has been actually been great to work with it has uh, it integrates very well with, uh, for example, performing multiple requests using uh, our fork join pools, for example, and uh, it has been quite stable as well, I must say. Uh, for me, uh, I guess the, what I think is a game changer is the local variable type inference that arrived in JDK 10 way back now, <laughs> time goes past by. Uh, but uh, local variable type inference, or VAR, as most people probably know it by short, I think it's great. In SCARA, we set out to use it everywhere we could. So there are excellent guides uh, provided by OpenEDK uh, experts on how to use local variable type inference appropriately, I guess. <laughs> but me and Robin both have experiences in both dynamically typed languages and statically typed languages. So we just went ahead and used war in every place we could. And personally, I think that's been awesome. Uh, it's a great addition to the language, it makes writing so much easier, and it makes reading much easier too. Another benefit is that you often can get by with much fewer imports, and also referring to uh, classes defined within classes is much easier. So if you have, for example, inner types uh, to encapsulate some functionality, it could be a bit cumbersome before you had to type when you typed out the type on the left hand side you would first go with the class and then dot and then the inner type and it could be a bit of a mouthful to read there uh, on the left hand side but with var uh, all those problems goes away and uh, that has been a blast for me yeah i can also mention that this also actually improves our productivity a bit i mean for for those of us that prefers an IDE to work, uh, they now they have quite good uh, integration with the local variable type inference. So if you are actually wondering, so what is this type? Uh, the IDE will actually show it for you right in the source code. Yeah, and for people like me, uh, I guess that's a much fewer number of Java developers. <laughs> that use uh, Vim uh, for writing the Java source code, then there's much less to type now. 
and that is great for my fingers. And that seems to have been all the questions, it's pretty silent now. So again, thank you all for coming and attending this session, it's been a blast presenting to you. And I hope you will check out our project at github.com slash openedk.